Hi, this is Zach. And this is Patrick. And welcome to Pipecast. Where we pipe up for pipes and pipe down for what? Well, here we are. Here we are, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. Another rainy, rainy day. I think I think God knows when we're going to do podcasts. He says, oh, let's just rain on that day. <laughs> I don't mind it. It's kind of like, it's got this like weird ambiance. You know, you just kind of hear the sprinkling. So you guys, I hope you all enjoy the sound of rain. It's not going anywhere. We're just going to let you hear the pitter-patter of the little droplets as we wax poetic about pipes and tobacco or whatever else we find uh, interesting. May even have a little wind chime here here and there. So, what are you smoking on today? I'm smoking some plum pudding. Seattle Pipe Club. In my dairy... Rustic by Peterson. Ooh. How about you? Smoking uh, Dunhill Navy Rolls, uh, uh, Virginia Perique, and my new Meerschaum, which is a skull. It's actually a, uh, it's not a very good carving of a skull. It kind of looks like the most anatomically incorrect skull I've ever seen, <laughs> with an extremely jutted out nasal cavity and a gum line that would. I, probably make a shark jealous <laughs> <laughs> but i mean i like it because it's so abnormal I, i'm kind of i i like i like meerschaum i like the way they color i like the way they smoke this is a perfect size bowl for me and i think um i think it's going to be kind of like my routinely smoker i will smoke a meerschaum so many times in a row just over and over again it's like what i just because i'm so protective yeah. of my briar but uh, I've kind of been on this weird vapor kick for the last couple of weeks. I've been smoking uh, Reiner Gold, uh, I think, all last week. And then I got a hold of uh, Navy Rolls by Dunhill and um, Fillmore by GLPs. And and it just, uh, I don't know, I just really enjoyed it pretty good. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think that there is something to be said for, like, the perfect smoke, you know, you're always like kind of chasing that and uh and i i I seem to find it in virginia Perique blends if i'm just kind of lazily going through a smoke with like a book or just a read now if i'm if i'm going to have a drink or something i like an english or a balkan blend but uh there's something to just sitting and relaxing with a virginia straight virginia or virginia Perique. you know yesterday I don't know what it was. I uh, I got an emulator on my phone, and I was playing Pokemon Fire Red. And I came out here to smoke. I was, tr- I was trying Cornell and Dill's Miskatonic mixture. I just wanted to see, you know, how it was. I'd already had uh, their Awakened Elder and their Innsmouth, Innsmouth, and um, I was just trying it out. And man, I just, I mean, I don't even remember that moment. I was out here for maybe 40 minutes, just smoking. And playing that game, and I mean, it just went by. It was like that. It was just, it was, I was in the zone. It would do that to you. I mean, like I said, uh, I think I talk about like kind of the Zen meditative state that tobacco can place you in. And you know, I think everyone who smokes a pipe, who's experienced it, will always chase it. They'll find it in different blends, in different times. Uh, it's just nice. You know, it's just nice to kind of maybe draw back from life a little bit, you know, and to sort of enjoy the smoke. But with that in mind, uh, I wanted to talk to you because we had spoken previously about the different blend types and why we do not like their names. Mm. I thought this would be a good opportunity to bring it up during uh, the podcast. So those of you who are new to smoking, pipe smoking in particular, um and you know this is going to be kind of a rehash for those who are a little bit more seasoned but uh pipe tobacco uh blends come in you know different styles there's a straight virginia uh, virginia perique virginia perique burley um we start to get into oriental and latakia being mixed in they become an english blend um and this is where everything gets really muddled and then a Balkan blend, uh, which is probably even more muddled. And then, of course, you have your aromatics, um, usually comprised of black Cavendish. Um, but kind of the 
the like the steam topped in the cased black cavendish where it's sort of a surfy you know kind of add-on but um the thing is is like basically all of tobacco makes sense until you jump into the oriental bandwagon um virginia what is it it's virginia virginia parique what is it or vapor virginia parique yeah what is virginia parique and burley well it's virginia parique burley they even have virginia burleys which is what they call it vapor yep some people call it a vapor what happens when you step into the english realm well is it uh an english if it has orientals yep and Latakia, yep. Virginia, yep. Creek, maybe a dash, but yep. Um, well, what defines Balkan? Well, all of those things <laughs> define it, too. So what's the difference between a Balkan and English? Well, maybe a Balkan is a little bit more oriental. Uh, or perhaps an English uh, is more oriental. Or maybe a Balkan has more Latakia, or an English has more Latakia. Nobody knows. I don't think anyone knows. Or if there is, like, a definitive answer, like, I haven't yeah. found it. Or, like, some people will say it's one, some people say it's the other. Mm-hmm. I've even, to make it even a little bit more confusing, I've even heard people say that if it's not aromatic, then it's English. Yes, yeah, no. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because I've seen blenders say that they have English blends for sale, and there's there's no Oriental, but only Latakia, or vice versa, they only have Orientals. And I thought that those two things go hand in hand. So, I guess in this conversation, we can say Pipecast's official stance is an English has to have both, a Latakia and an Oriental. Yes. But, if it's just Oriental, then it's an Oriental blend. If it's just Latakia, as far as, far as like one or the other, is there, mm-hmm. you know, is there Latakia with your Virginia and your Perique or whatever? And it's a Latakia blend. Is that where we're going with this? I mean, the way I would do it is is that anytime you see Latakia or Oriental added to a blend, it's a, it's an English. And then I would just not even say that anymore. I would just take out English altogether, actually. So what I would say is if you have any blend that adds Oriental, it's just an Oriental blend. Yeah. All right? Anytime you put Latakia on it, then it becomes a Latakia blend. Because... Regardless, a little bit of Latakia or a lot, you're going to, that is going to really hog the bowl as far as flavor. Latakia is always pronounced. Mm. Like anytime I smoke Latakia, whether it be 50% of the mixture or 10%, I can still get that smokiness out of it every single time. It doesn't seem like it, a dab of do you kind of thing. I mean, it's just. It is just there. It's very prevalent. So, in my opinion, anytime you add Latakia to it, then it should be called a Latakia blend. And then, when you start to put in Black Cavendish, Perique, or any other blends with Oriental, Virginia, Burley, um, I'm pretty sure I said Latakia, then I think instead of calling it a Balkan or just having some sort of, you just call it the lot, you know? And it's just a lot of tobacco, everything. I'll have a lot. <laughs> And that means that everything you could imagine is in there. Proportion, but that's kind of the way I see plum pudding. It is the lot. It's got black Cavendish, yeah. Latakia, yeah. Orientals, of course. Does it have Virginia? Yes. Burley, yes. Um, there might not be Burley in it, actually, but still. I think Perique's in it, too. I think Perique is in it. But I don't know if Burley's in it, but it, it just seems like everything is in Balkan blends. They're just, so just call them the lot. You know? You can, I think... At least I would understand it. That's funny because those those uh, uh, Lovecraftian ones from uh, Cornell and Dill, they're just kitchen sink blends. The lot. Like, they got all... They got all kinds of stuff thrown in there. Black Cavendish. Um, I believe there's Virginias, there's Perique, some Latakia in some of them, and then like Katsuri and Katarini. Some, some crazy, I guess they're Orioles. Yep. Um, everything's in them. Uh, and what's funny is I've re-sort of dedicated some of my pipes, and the one I'm smoking in, it only has five blends to it. It's the three Cornell and Dill um, Lovecraft blends I have, It's and it's Plum Pudding and Plum Pudding Special Reserve, because they're just, I guess it's a Balkan pipe. Well, based on the old terms, but Maybe. now it's called The Lot. 
Don't get us wrong, we're probably not going to call them these terms. We're just kind of having a little disagreement with the term terms used, or just the terminology in general. Disagreeing with society. Very, I mean, it's very plain until you go beyond a Virginia Burley Parique. Then it just gets, it becomes this amalgam of confusion and disagreement, you know? And it, it seems like the right road is the way we did the kind of the standard ways we talk about Virginia or Parique. It's just calling them what they are. And then if you add anything to that and that becomes the dominant fixture in the blend, just name it that. If unless it's Latakia, because I think like any time you have Latakia, it's it, it just overpowers everything. Um, Chelsea Morning has a dash of Latakia, and I, I assume it's probably mild, but I can taste it. I can taste it. To me it's not I can I, I know what they're doing with it. I enjoy the blend, but Chelsea Morning I can st I know that there's Latakia in it, so to me, there's no such thing as a, as a small quantity of Latakia. It's going to it's going to announce itself as soon as you light up. I even saw you sent me a link to an app the other day, mm -hmm. uh, the, like the Pipe Notebook or something. That's right. And I was using it, and um, it calls. Which I mean, I don't know who filled all this information out in it. But I added, and I looked at Billy Bud. It calls Billy Bud an American blend. I think probably because of the cigar. I don't know. But I thought that was weird. Even more interesting is Cornell and Dill blends Billy Bud, right? Billy Bud, I believe, is a, is a Herman Melville reference. One of his novellas, perhaps. Herman Melville, who wrote Moby Dick. Cornell Dill is an American company based out, I think, South Carolina now. And uh, they were in North Carolina. I think they moved recently. Maybe not that recently, but recently enough. Anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is, is they call it an American blend. But sometimes I don't always think in terms of American, like is in the United States. Mm -hmm. but whenever I hear that, I don't know where this conditioning has come from. I think that it's more of a kind of north, central, and south. You know, mm -hmm. because those are the Americas. Like, regardless of what people want, people from Nicaragua or Mexico are Americans to a yeah. certain extent. Yeah, they're Americans. Yeah. I mean, you can be specific as the central or north or south, but, you know, I mean, they're Americans. So we are United something States. like that, it's actually dead on, because if you have Cigar Leaf, which would probably be Honduran or Nicaraguan or, you know, I mean, I'm assuming some blends out in the world have Cuban Leaf, then, uh, yeah, it truly is. It didn't change. It yeah. might be a little bit more Caribbean or Caribbean, however, whatever your flavor for pronunciation is. But, uh, yeah, it truly is an American blend. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess Wait a minute. Does it have Latakia in it? Billy Bud? Yes. I think so. Well, then I guess it's not an American blend. <laughs> Hang tight. <laughs> Hang tight. Um, I got a little trusty little database I have created for my blendsies. Um, oh, Billy Bud. Billy Bud is a um, Burley Cigar Leaf. Yep, Latakia in Virginia. And it's technically, based on like tobacco reviews, called in English. But for some reason that that um that little app calls it an American. Interesting. See, I, again, I guess that will be another thing, is if you add cigar leaf. Cause, well, I mean, the only thing I've had that has cigar leaf is Billy Bud. And I can tell it has cigar leaf. So I wonder if it... By putting cigar leaf in it, does that overpower the Latakia? It might. I doubt it, though. And then it would be called American at that point. Well, I mean, if you're going to talk about American the way most... US well, the way you the way you just it. said. Well, it. I'm just yeah, saying, yeah. if you're going to do it, like, the most American, in terms of the way, like, most United States citizens identify themselves, the most American blend you can get is Virginia Parique. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Because it's us. That's America's blend. Yeah. Now, Dark Fire Kentucky. 
You know, that, that's another version, I guess. You could actually make a an American English or an American Latakia and, and just use Dark Fire as your Latakia. Yeah. It probably isn't going to have the same smoky kind of consistency as... Because Dark Fire is a Burley, right? That's, I believe it is. That's become, yeah. And Perique's a Burley. I, that has become Perique. Don't call me on that. I don't know that one. I was thinking... It, it probably was. is. Correct us if we say something out of line. But don't get mad at and us, And if please. you disagree with us saying that it's English or Balkan, please just hit us with hashtag uh, podcast is wrong. Yeah, <laughs> podcast is wrong. Okay. I mean, I'd like to hear you guys' feedback because in my opinion, just across the board, the naming mechanics are just, they're just not there right now. I'm lucky in that I know a ton of blends and I... I can suss out what most of them are just by smoking a lot. But, I mean, if, I mean, look at GLPs and how much, like, Latakia blended things he has. I mean, he has Meridian and Quiet Nights and uh, Gaslight and Abingdon and, I think, Charring Cross. Like, all those are variations of a Balkan or an English. Because I would think, in a way, Meridian is a Balkan blend on the standard definition. I, because it was one of the contestants against uh, Black House and uh, Balkan Blue in the uh, the pipe convention competition they had to get it to taste like uh, Balkan Sobrani. I mean, is that, you know, is Balkan Sobrani, is it the standard? Because I mean, everyone kind of, it's, it's a very revered tobacco. Is it the standard for, I don't know. That's a good question. And just so you guys know, talking about the Balkan Sobrani from like the 50s to the 70s, not the J.F. Germain and Sons Balkan Sobrani that is, I say it's available, it is intermittently available, depending on when you can get stuff. Jumping off that, we'd like to uh, talk about a, a special segment that will be going on for the next eight weeks or eight episodes or so. And it's to help me identify these different types of tobacco better as a youngling in the pipe game. I have ordered several different um, of the Cornell and Dill component tobaccos. Uh, the two, the Red Virginia and the Bright Virginias. Uh, I think I got cu uh, Cube Cut Burley, uh, some Perique, Latakia, some Ismer. And uh, that's a like dark fire, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what I. I think that's all of them. But I would have the, huh? the Patrick Ark. Yeah, you yeah. Know, like a phoenix rise out of the ashes at the bottom of his bowl. Yeah, reborn. <laughs> uh, so the the way it'll work is I'll smoke on. I already got them wrote down. I don't have them with me, but I'll smoke one for a whole week leading up to an episode and tell you what I think about it and then I'll switch it the next week and keep going write down my notes and maybe by the end of that arc I will be a little bit more I'll be able to pick out these different things and different tobaccos better well at least you have a better understanding of the characteristics of the different leaves that are comprising whatever blend you're smoking yeah I don't think any of this is bad. I think this is probably going to give you quite an advantage on sussing out what is in specific, uh, even more so in specific quantities. I bet you, you can probably pick it out because you'll know which one's a little bit more apparent just based on your smoking it. Yeah, I'm very, um, very interested to see what smoking just Latakia and just Perique is going to be. I'd be interested to know, though, if these blends have any casing or toppings on them. I would think they shouldn't because I watched the the video that Cornell and Dale put out about those component blends and how you can get this kit that has all those in it and you can measure out and try out your own recipes. And I would think since they're trying to get people to try their own recipes, they wouldn't want to case them. They would want them to be just what they are that way people can sort of figure out what kind of you know what kind of recipes they want to make 
I mean, I'm not saying it very well could be topped or case, but I wouldn't think they would be. Or if I was them, I wouldn't. Right. We're on week three of me wading through my licorice leaf. I got oh a couple yeah. More weeks. It's still sitting there. How, wait, how long you gotta wait? I was gonna give it four or five weeks. That'll be interesting to try. I'm sort of creating my own aromatic. I like licorice a lot. And you can never find a licorice flavored tobacco because, you know, it's like me and young 19th century German boys, I guess, who like licorice really. Um, but I thought that the harshness of full Virginia Flake, I probably should have went with something like Best Brown. But I had a tin of Full Virginia, and I was like, you know what, I'll try this. But um, take a take Full Virginia Flake. I laid it out, and uh, I can drop you you guys a link uh, to um, you know. I have some photos of the concoction that I blended in the in the the uh, the flake that I applied it to. But um, took some Full Virginia, laid it out, dried it a little bit, and I and I cooked. Uh, licorice root and anise seed um for about three hours i kind of got it down to like a concentrated extract and if you don't know licorice root is very sweet it's a very sweet uh root so boiling that down i sort of came up with in distilled water i came up with this extract i put it in a bottle i sprayed my tobacco with it um after it had dried pretty thoroughly and then i took a, an old reiner gold tin and I and I'd washed it out, and I stoved it in the oven for about 195 degrees for about four hours, um, and, and then the steam sort of cooked over it and everything, and it darkened up the leaf. And then I just took that because Ryan or Gold is like a paint can, plopped the top back on it, threw it on my shelf, and it's been sitting there with its its newly stoved licorice flavoring, and I'm just kind of letting it. You know, really just have a moment to sit kind of in a dark, cool area for, you know, about a month before I pull it out and try to smoke it. And what I want to do is probably do a direct comparison between another tin of full Virginia Flake that I have and uh, and this new licorice leaf, which is what I've been calling it because I'm not very creative. But um, <laughs> like I said, we can... Link to that, uh, I think it's an imager link where I have some pictures up. And if you guys have any questions, I can let you know what I did. But ultimately, just creating an extract and applying it to a Virginia that I planned on stoving and then just letting it rest for an extended period of time. So I'm hoping that, you know, that it, it just sort of really bonds with the flake and kind of gives you a full licorice flavor without really killing off or deleting some of the, the Virginia flavoring that I like. But the reason stoving or aging in general is good is because uh, Virginias do have quite a considerable amount of sugar and it does um, complement the aging process um, as the sugars, I guess, over time ferment maybe a little bit and just kind of mellow you know, because if, if anybody's ever gotten a Samuel Gall with full Virginia flake, it's a stout, it's a stout blend. I mean, it's, it's a blend. It's a stout flake. Um, I don't guess it's blended with anything. It's just Virginia. But, like, it's very stout. And mellow, you know, as things mellow, I mean, because I, I find that Perique mellows out Virginia. Um, you can really tell the difference between something, say, like, Reiner Gold or uh, Navy Rolls or Scudo or um, Fillmore to say Orlick Golden Slice. Mm -hmm. I think Golden Slice has a little bit more Virginia. It's a little bit more rambunctious of a mm. blend. Uh, it, it'll it'll kind of burn at you. You kind of have to really take it slow and really ease into Orlick Golden Slice. Hmm. I've been seeing Orlick around. I've been wanting to give it a shout but I haven't I'm sort of <clears throat> I don't know I'm I might be just to make it more um, okay I'm a researcher and a collector I'm two things that sh I shouldn't be combined 
I like to research things, and then I like to collect a lot of stuff. And pipe tobacco, I think that's what, like, when you, you know, got me into it, that's what really kept me going, was the, oh man, you got all these different kind of blends, you got all these different kinds of uh, blenders, and all this stuff, and it's just like, different kind of cuts, um, nicotine level, like, all this stuff that goes into it, and it's just, you know, it could be a little overwhelming, but I think what I'm trying to do is restrict it down to, uh, I might just, for a while, just be a uh, a Cornell and Dill kind of guy. Very respectable company. Good blenders. I mean, I think you've kind of heard some of my complaints on some American blenders. I feel like the way it's blended doesn't sort of clump sometimes, and then I get kind of inconsistency throughout the bowl. But, you know, I think... What we we determined it could be just because of the way what they're tending. That I mean, you you can't help but think that those gold tins definitely hold hold the the freshness in better than those little aluminum tins. And they like this, we said we they both could be vacuum sealed, but there's something to when you take one of those fifty gram you know golden disc tins and you hear that that sound. Yeah. I mean that's yeah. If you don't hear that, actually, I was in the, the grocery store today, and I realized those tins are the same tins that Frito Lay puts like their French dip in for chips. It's the exact same tin. Really? But I looked at it, and I was like, "That looks familiar." I went and grabbed it. It's got the same top, same way the bottom is shaped. It's the same thing. Or I mean, if you picked it up and it said Frito Lay. Virginia Prairie Blend, <laughs> French onion, <laughs> <laughs> vapor French onion. Oh God! Would you have bought it? Yeah, probably. My interest would have piqued me enough. That'd be bad. If you don't like it as a dip, bring it home and smoke it. <laughs> lather it on some. <laughs> lather it on your pipe and light it. But uh. Well, um, I think it's also time to announce uh, this week's version of uh, Pipe of the Week. Pipe of the Week. Yeah, it is, um, I stumbled upon it, I think it was today or yesterday. Um, trying to see where I, where I saw that at. It is old um, Grandpa Bones is the user. Uh, and it's, uh, G-R-A-M-P-A Bones. And it's a picture, it's got three pipes in it. It's, uh, his, uh, Balkovic pipes. I think it was Mark Balkovic. And at the top, there's a Devil Ants. Devil Ants, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a Bent Dublin. And the very bottom is a poker. And that poker is what I got my eye on right there. So that poker... That's the pipe of the week right there. Pipe of the week is the poker. Huh? Yep. That's a little old stubby fella. That's exactly one I'd like to have. A little old stubby poker fella. Congratulations, Grandpa Bones. Grampy Bones. Grampy Bones. So, kind of a surprise moment for me. I am reading a fantasy novel. Holy cow. For those of you who don't know... Um, I like science fiction and horror. I like literary fiction, biographies, history. I read uh, quite a lot, some philosophy. Uh, but I've never, I can never get behind fantasy, which is strange uh, and sort of alienates me from the pipe community because I feel that a lot of people who smoke pipes got into it because of J.R.R. Tolkien, or Tolkien, uh, The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings trilogy. I'm sure everyone who heard this is like, yeah, we know a guy. But um, I just, I never, I couldn't get into him. Uh, it's, it's very specific why I'm not, not a big fan of fantasy, uh, especially like high fantasy or stuff like that. And that's, uh, it comes down to one thing, um, and it's uh, it's dragons. Like, I just can't, I just can't get behind them. As soon as I 
deal with a dragon in a novel, see it on a television show or in a film. I'm out. I just can't. It's the weirdest thing. I can, I, for some reason, demons or wizards are, are elves or orcs are so believable. But a dragon is the most unrealistic thing ever. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I just don't, don't get it. I'm not a big fan of it. But, uh, like most things, um, someone was talking about wanting to get into reading, and uh, as I am also a sympathetic reader, uh, I said, well, you know, pick a book, and I'll read it with you, and um, and we can discuss it, because if you've ever tried to get someone who is interested in reading into reading, the best thing to do if you're sympathetic to their wants, if you're a good friend, or, or just a more interested acquaintance, maybe. Read a book with them because they'll have something to discuss with you and it'll make your relationship better and um, it's really a good way to get them into reading just in general. So um, I, I have a co-worker who mentioned it and I said, well, I'll read something with you and uh, she picked a fantasy book. So I'm like, well, I that's fine. So, um, <laughs> called The Name of the Wind by um, Rothsfeld. Patrick Rothsfuss. Patrick Rothsfuss? Ross, Rothsfuss, I think. Okay, so um, apparently it's pretty famous. I don't, I'm not a big fan. To, to add to that, to the, to the I don't like fantasy elements sometimes, like dragons, to add to that, another thing that's a pet peeve of mine is uh, if a novel goes over about 650 pages, as a writer, someone who writes, I think, you know, you probably could have edited that a little bit more. Um, I think uh, anything over 650 pages is a little indulgent. Um, you probably could have edited it down. And since fantasies, like The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan and, uh, and I think Sanderson, who helped complete it, uh, goes into like the 14 book, 2,000 page territory. I'm not going to invest that amount of time in it for just one story. I mean, it's just too much investment. If you like it, that's great. I'm, I kind of envy you, but it seems that people who read fantasy really enjoy it, and they have a camaraderie that's deep when they talk to other fantasy fans, uh, especially a fantasy uh, series. But if you can't really capture the whole arc of something in one 600 page novel i'm basically out and so to add to that i think this this name of the wind is a trilogy and it's 700 pages i'm breaking all the norms so if a dragon shows up i'm just i might be just going against the grain here and accepting my fate that i can't you just can't escape dragons because people tried their hardest to get me to watch game of thrones and i was like oh okay cool what's it about and she's like well there's this girl and she's marooned from this other country, and she she trains dragons. It's like that's all right. I'm not gonna watch it. <laughs> Good try, but I can't I can't get behind the dragon. And it's just dragons. I just think they're just stupid. Well, I was gonna say, if you forego the Hobbit and just Lord of the Rings, I don't know if there's. I mean, I don't know if you call those foul beasts that the Nazgul ride. I don't know if you'd call those dragons. So if you don't consider those dragons, Lord of the Rings would be okay. Aren't they like winged serpents, though? Yeah. But they don't breed. Well, yeah, they do breed. Well, I guess they are dragons. Nobody ever calls them a dragon, though. They call them... I only ever heard them called foul beasts. I mean... Yeah, they, okay, yeah, they... Yeah. I don't know. I mean, if you guys disagree about what the foul beasts are... I mean, you can make an argument, and I'll try to pick it up. I guess once again, it seems like I'm already resigned to my fate anyway. So there's not much of an argument to be had. I'm reading this story. It's pretty good so far. I mean, it's a good setup at least. I'm gonna start it Saturday, just to pick up with you. But I mean, Dragonheart though. Okay, like yeah, but Sean Connery voiced the dragon. Like I, always, everyone gets a gimme, you know. <laughs> There's tons of people out there that have like that one thing. It's like, I hate all licorice except for this one. 
or you know, everyone's got something like that. So you know, I don't like all dragons except for the Sean Connery version. Pete's dragon? Nope. <laughs> I uh, I don't know what that would be for me. I don't. I don't. You don't have like some sort of instantaneous aversion to something. I'm not fond of gore, but it doesn't, it doesn't drive me away from the movie. Um, just because I have such a simplistic mind, like I have such a, a simple. <laughs> well, you said that it didn't come out quite uh, right. Yeah, I have a, such a simple mind. Okay. Like, eh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have such a simplistic view of uh, how I like my suspense, my thrillers, my horror, and it doesn't involve gore or body or anything like that. It's very Carpenter esque. Yeah, you have. You also. You know, I mean, you should have a timeless approach to film anyway. Um, you like older movies, really. What's weird though is when they're redone. I usually like the redos better. That's interesting because they usually just amp up the violence. Well, I guess I'm looking at... Basically, The Force Awakens is a redo of A, a New Hope. And from a guy who enjoys the way a movie looks more so than anything else, Force Awakens is better in that regard. He's putting, I don't know if he's purposely putting me in this position or not, because I think he is, but oh, I'm he good. knows my views on this. And if you walk out of the movie and say, to me, in my opinion, if you walk out of a movie and say, ah, oh, it was beautiful, then mm -hmm. it was probably the worst story ever written. Because if you can't tell me why you loved it outside of, like, I like the way it looked. Well, if you lead with, you like the, I like the way it looks, but then you dive into more about the story and the characters, then, then yeah. But if, yeah, like you said, if that's the only thing you can say about the movie. I'd be hard pressed to say that if you lead with that, it's, I mean, it, you should always lead with, it was amazing because the story was so rich and blah, 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 blah. It was also beautiful. See, but I, I, I just feel, that's the way this, I feel about it. You're not going to like this. That's fine. This is the debate as old as time between us. The first Blade Runner is that for me. It looks beautiful, not so much story. Like that's what I would lead lead with. If, I would even lead that with twenty forty nine, which I thought was a better movie. Um, I think the visuals of both movies surpass anything that else that the story's telling, or anything else that the movie does. Well, yes and no, because to me there are two types of films. There is okay. So to me that there there's always a tight plot that is a type of film tight like everything seems to matter now if you guys don't know what i'm talking about watch films like the big lebowski or psycho um it's it's going to be everything has a purpose everything leads into something else it's a, just it's a tight tightly written script those are nice i like so those. those are good that's probably your preference then you have films like blade runner where the point of the film is not the story. Because Blade Runner, the first one, is just, he's hunting down replicants or androids um, and and retiring them or killing them. And that's the same plot of Blade Runner 2049 and then at the beginning and then there, there becomes a new plot which is uh, to find a crossbreed uh, of replicant and human so those are the two plots those plots are only a vehicle for a character development story mm. you mm. learn who the replicants are who Deckard is or who uh, K is and the other characters within the films um, more so than you do about the heavy lifting that the plot is kind of taking. Uh, that's just my opinion. I think that the plot is secondary to the character development and arc. The character arc is, in a way, its own source. So what happens is if you do a true... The problem with 
a lot of film is, and the, the thing that Blade Runner 2049 got right, is when you do something like that, two things are going to happen. One, your film is going to be extremely long, which is a fairly long film, right? And two, like I said, the story is, you know, sort of secondary to everything that the characters and their motivations and their feelings and how they sort of emote and everything that surrounds them. It, the whole arc of the film, cinematography, sound, uh, design, acting, all of that contributes to the story. In a way, those types of character arcs, when they're so fully developed and everything matters to the point of the character, are actually a richer film experience. But the, the tight plot is just, it's a, it really is pure and, and just a, a, a natural escapism to me. I'm not as invested in anything when I'm just watching a tight plot. Die Hard's a really great example of a tight plot. You know, you love John McClane, and like, there's. I'm not taking away from Bruce Willis, but if they only ever made one, and you would always talk about that story. Yeah. You don't talk about like, yeah, the Nakatomi Building is beautiful. It's like, no, you, uh, it doesn't yeah. matter. It's, it's, it's McClane. And now everything though, that doesn't mean that there's not story in Blade Runner, and that character development doesn't leach into tight plots. But those things are, I think, secondary. To each other, you know, depending it's, on which one you're talking. It's about. just lucky that Blade Runner was able to to have such great character development with such great cinematography and and uh, set set uh, set piecing. Right, and it, same thing with Die Hard. It's, I mean, you're just lucky that Bruce Willis could develop a character so well. Yeah. Now, which you know, okay, like like Zach alluded to earlier, it's the tale as old as time or the debate as old as time with us because you come at it from more of a story character driven kind of standpoint and i'm much more of like when i watch a movie more times than not the first thought in my head is which i, I enjoy some escapism but the first thought in my head is how did he get that shot how did that cameraman do that and i'm like i put myself in the cameraman's perspective and i enjoy, I enjoy the way uh movies look so many good um like Inherent vice, great opening, just because of the cinematography. Well, not just because of the cinematography, but that is what sells it for me. Um, uh, uh, Hell or High Water, great opening, just one long tracking shot. Man, I don't know. Something about it is great. Uh, but because we've all, we've had this debate, you know, several times, we've, you know, some things I've said you've taken, some things you've said I've taken. I've probably taken more things that you've said. But I came up with my barstool theory, which is a barstool's got three legs. One leg, for a movie to be good, you have to have two out of the three legs. Um, and that would be acting, story, and cinematography. Now, you, you got to have at least two to be okay. I, it's great to have three. That makes a good movie. But you can still have all three and be too drunk on CGI that you fall off the bar stool. <laughs> so that's that's my little little secondary piece. I, I I'm not a big CGI person, even though I'm a big Marvel superhero kind of film watcher. When you go full CGI, you sort of losing me a little bit. Maybe maybe CGI is my dragon. Yeah, because you have a just aversion to it. It seems strange though that you like Star Wars. Well, if you do CGI well, if I can, if I don't notice, like the end of Wonder Woman, that is way too much CGI and it's very, very, very not realistic looking. The The Hobbit Battle of the Five Armies, a lot of CGI. Very bad looking. But The Force Awakens. Rogue One. See, yeah, it looks good. I mean, they, they, they do their due diligence. Um, when when Disney and Marvel de-age 
uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Samuel L. Jackson, uh, specifically specifically Samuel L. Jackson in the new Captain Marvel, uh, but then uh, uh, Michael Douglas and Ant Man. They did they did a good job. I can't be upset about that. But you know now you can have really awful CGI in like an '80s cheesy kind of way, like R.I.P.D. That's a really good movie. It is a lot of CGI, but it's like sort of, it seems like it's on purpose. I feel like if they had had really good CGI, it wouldn't have been as good of a movie. It's kind of like the way I feel about The Mummy, the original one. It's actually a really good movie. The CGI dates it so hard. It's... Wait, the one with Brandon Fraser? Oh, yeah. I love that movie. Yeah, not the Tom Cruise one. Oh, God. Well, I didn't even watch it, so I can't say anything about it. Well, I think that's the reason why it's probably bad. You just, you know... I made, the mistake, I made the mistake of watching Genom a couple of weeks ago. I'm sorry. I, mean, that's awful. I, I don't even think the CGI or anything would bother me in Venom. It's the acting. I could tell from the trailer that some of those lines were going to make me just want to punch somebody. Oh, you will. There's a line specifically in Venom um, where the dialogue is it's shocking that it was written. <laughs> he, he gets out of the water he's on a like kind of a buoy. And he stands up, and he goes, my legs were broken, and now they're not broken. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> like, Why did you have to tell me that? That is not a natural... Also, you're by yourself. You well... Think things like that. You could, you yeah, could you act could easily... out yes, yes. that, and I would understand. Did you see his leg? Because I saw his leg broken. Okay, I was going to say, in the scene prior, leading up, you see his legs get broken. Mm -hmm. It's one of those, which I fully believe in, is the show don't tell. He, he could have, instead of just saying, my legs were broken, you already saw him broke. or uh, You already saw them get broken. So he comes up and he's walking. It's sort of like, he could have done like a little dumbfounded look like, what's going on? You know, that, 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 that's, that's not great dialogue, but it's better than that. Mm -hmm. You know? I think I told you that that was my like only beef with uh, Blade Runner 2049 was one scene where they should have shown not to, not told. Uh, I think it was when uh, Harrison Ford and Ryan Gosling are fighting in that uh, like in that room where like Elvis keeps flashing up on the that hologram of Elvis. I I like that scene a lot except for that little part just because uh, my girlfriend loves that song that's playing so it's like. Nah, I enjoyed that because I know she enjoyed it. But uh, the very end, he's like, "You want to keep fighting? Or you want to go get a drink?" Like in the very next scene, I'm just gonna skip a little bit. The very next scene, they go get a drink. So why did Ryan Gosling have to force? I think I'll take a drink. Like we didn't need that. It, it was just completely unnecessary because <laughs> you were about to show them at a bar drinking, or, you know, or walking to the bar getting a drink. You see, you could have just left that empty, and then we would have known. I don't treat me like I have some kind of knowledge like, that I'm not ignorant, you know, as the audience member. Treat me like I know something. Yeah. But well, that was really my only problem with that movie. Going back to that movie, um, not a lot wrong with it. it uh... I rewatched, which I did not see as many movies in 2018 as I did in 2017. I pro I saw 20 movies in 2017, the most I've ever seen in a year. Uh, uh, and I, I was really happy to uh, I was able to you know dig in and find out okay, which ones that I like better, and I rated them all and all this stuff. And I don't mean to offend anybody, but I think I, three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri was probably my favorite of that year. But the one that shocked me the most, which I have to like almost give it more credit, is Jumanji. Uh, <laughs> it's it's. It is startling when a movie that is, you know, is going to be terrible isn't. Yeah, like it. I like I like Kevin Hart, and I I mean I like The Rock as a wrestler growing up, but I just don't think he's that great of an actor. So me seeing that, I was like, oh man, I don't think this is going to be anything. But I get in there, and it's just like, man, they 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 honor the original so well. Setting it in a video game setting made it to where they could cut corners. They didn't have to flesh out a villain because, I mean, I know there are good games that flesh out villains, but old style video games, they don't flesh out a villain. A villain just wants to 
kill everybody because he wants to kill everybody. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. So if you set it in a video game, you don't have to flesh out the villain. It's just something you don't have to do, and that's perfect. It's ingenious. And you can make it where The Rock says cheesy things, and it's just like, well, I mean, you know, he's, he's a video game character. You know, the guy's portraying it. And then, of course, Jack Black's performance of trying to play a 17, 16-year-old girl inside of his body it was great. <laughs> so, it was a great movie. Um, but what I was going to say is I rewatched my favorite of 2018, which is Mission Impossible Fallout the other day. And um, I don't know. I, I think uh, I, I was reading an article about how Tom Cruise is like killing the the standard action movie because you know a normal action movie that you know like let's say any old James Bond movie if a guy was trying to climb a helicopter you would like <laughs> there would be so many cutscenes but because of Tom Cruise and his like death wish as he gets older is you didn't have to do any cutscenes like there's two two or three cutscenes of him climbing that that helicopter and it's just like this is not what I expected, you know. I enjoy it. Some people may find it shocking, but I, I think it's awesome. Poor Tom Cruise. He, he literally just wants to die to get out of Scientology. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad for the guy. Like, it doesn't, you know, you don't hear it publicized as often as today. Where it's just like Tom Cruise doing his own stunts. And it's like, this guy just really wants out. He knows he can't get out. <laughs> so he's just going to die. He's like, you know what, I'm just going to. Just take myself out via helicopter or plane or stun off of the uh, Burj Khalifa in Dubai. You know, just anything at all to not have to uh, audit myself again or go through auditing again. He he's the first actor to ever on film or you know on camera do a that halo jump. Um, and he did it a hundred times. They, fit, they 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 did that shot a hundred times. Really? Well, not a hundred. And what film was that in? This Fallout Mission Impossible Fallout. Oh, really? Yeah, they 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 practiced the scene, or they took a hundred takes. I can't imagine the fuel on the plane to get back up there is cheap. Oh yeah, he said it was pretty exhausting. I mean, jumping out of that plane. And riding the whole, riding it the whole way down, and then getting That's up there. Oh, hundred things, man! Like, what is your backup if your chute doesn't open? It's just like take ninety nine. Yeah, I hope the rest of the film was shot, and it obviously wasn't because Henry Cavill had to have that mustache during Justice League. Yeah, yeah. That's that's sort of another reason why I wanted to see. I've never watched any other Mission Impossible. I think I've, I've seen the first one. But I have not seen two, three, four, five, how many there are. And I was just like, uh, I think I posted, this is a little, what do they call this? Self brag or what do they call it? Humble brag? Humble brag. This is a humble brag. Uh, you, you see, I, I'm not in with today's kids terminology. Um, but uh, it's like, I think I posted on, on Facebook, I was like, your my mission that I've chosen to accept is go see Mission Impossible without having seen any of the ones that came before it. <laughs> uh, which I, I didn't really need to, it, it, it wasn't relying on it. But uh, the way that director said, he, he said that, because uh, this is the first time that a director had filmed two Mission Impossibles. Everybody else, it always, I think the, the thing with Mission Impossible was always... You, a new director comes on every time. This is the first one that's done it twice. And he realized, he's like, I just have to film this movie on the go. Like, we don't have a full story. Like, we know where we want to go. We know what we want to accomplish. But it's not, nothing is set in stone. And I think, I think Tom Cruise broke his ankle on the very first day of shooting. So, I mean, that threw everything for a loop. But it was a good movie. Like I, I mean, I, I get a lot of enjoyment out of it. It does a lot of things visually that I like. And I mean, I did preface that. I mean, the story was fine. The thing is, Tom Cruise movies are very much like Marvel movies. There's a formula to them, and as long as you adhere to the formula, you're, you're going to be a box office success. Um, but this one had a little bit more to it. I think uh, it was a little, maybe it was a little tighter. You know, 
than his others. Like I said, I haven't seen them, so I don't know. Hmm. But, um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I enjoy it. I don't a lot of Tom Cruise watching very often. Like, uh, you know, I mean, I've seen, you know, some of the standard films, uh, Interview with Vampire, um, Magnolia, um, Vanilla Sky, um, what's the Rain Man. Rain Man, yeah. My favorite is uh, Risky, Risky Business. Business. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the my favorite Tom Cruise movie. I, mean, I don't guess you can get around his career without seeing Risky Business and Cocktail. And Top Gun. I've never seen Top Gun. I haven't either. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen it. Everyone gets on to me about it, like I'm not an American or something like that. And I was like, what? I've seen Days of Thunder, but not Top Gun. Is that the racing one? Yeah. I haven't seen that one either. I know that's with Nicole Kidman. And uh, Fred Thompson. Hmm. But no, I never, never saw that. But um, I haven't seen Cocktail either. Oh, and of course I was watched Shut because I've seen everything by Stanley Kubrick. But mm. that's about it. You'll find out if you stick with us long enough. I haven't seen a lot of movies, <laughs> <laughs> but I do like movies a lot. I just haven't seen that many. I haven't seen. I've probably seen a lot. But I haven't seen the ones that everybody should have seen. I didn't watch the Terminators until 2015. All of them? I hadn't seen any of them until then. Good grief. But I watched them all. I don't even know how you could survive the 90s without seeing Terminator 2. I mean, I'm not... A okay, look. It seems like that was like a... It was always on television. I, and I may have seen them... But I don't count seeing a movie unless I have sat down purposely to watch it fully all the way through. Like, if I catch the last half of a movie, it don't count. If it's just playing in the background and I'm doing something else, it don't count. I'm purposely there to escape into the movie. After, of course, I realize how the director's shooting is shot. Yeah. I mean, I guess you sort of have to see it from start to finish to really appreciate it that's for sure uh or maybe consider yourself having seen it officially yeah i don't know i mean because i don't think i ever saw like for the longest time predator was yeah. just whatever i saw on television it was i was at least 15 before i saw the unedited version mm -hmm. uh, i actually got a theory about predator that I don't care how bad the bar fight is or whatever's going on. If you turn on Predator, everyone that's in the middle of that tussle will stop and be like, hey, Predator's on. <laughs> just like, let's just chill for a second. I, I've actually seen the same thing happen, not in a bar situation, but any good old group of boys from the South, from like a small town uh, city, or I mean a small town uh, in the South, you turn on Forrest Gump, they're stopping anything they're doing. I've seen it happen. Huh. I guess it's just those movies are just so quotable. I guess so. And just so entertaining. The most quotable movie for me in my life is Oh Brother Art, though. Me and, my, me and my dad, we would ride around and we would go through the entire movie oh. quoting it. Coen Brothers are talented that way. I like the Coen Brothers a lot. Um, there's one thing I was going to say. I don't know. It, it escaped me. Um, I don't know what it was now, but uh, let's see here. I don't know. I might about wrap her up. Yep. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the end of it. I think so. I'm at the down at the bottom. How about you? Yeah, so, so much so. All right. Well, we'll catch y'all next time. This has been a Pipecast production, and we hope to see you at the next full bowl.